Hi, my name is Kathy Clark. I'm with the Lawyers Committee for Better Housing. My agency has been working with the Illinois Department of Human Rights to develop fair housing trainings. The webcast that we are presenting today is a general fair housing training. It's an overview of things that we think you should know about fair housing. There are additional trainings on special topics that you may want to watch in addition to this one. This training was funded by a grant from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. First off, to talk about fair housing, we should know what it is. It's defined as the right of all people to live wherever they choose, to have access to housing, which means seeking, purchasing, selling, leasing, or renting, and to fully enjoy their homes without unlawful discrimination, interference, coercion, threats, or intimidation by owners, landlords, or real estate agents, or any other persons. Fair housing laws in this country uh, secure the rights of all Americans to seek housing in an open market without discrimination. However, studies have shown that there is a lot of discrimination remaining in our housing market. For instance, one out of four Latino families and one in five Af African American families are discriminated against in the rental market. That means that when they go out to seek an apartment, something happens of a discriminatory nature. It might be telling them that something isn't available when it is. It might be requiring a higher security deposit. There are different kinds of discriminatory acts against minorities. In addition, one out of four deaf persons are refused service when they're using the TTY relay system. And one out of four persons with wheelchairs are told about fewer units than non-disabled persons. The Fair Housing Act, which is the federal law, has a dual purpose. As established by Congress when this was adopted, the purpose is to eliminate housing discrimination and as well promote residential integration. Fair housing facts. Nationwide, there are over 10,000 complaints filed yearly. The most common allegation in fair housing complaints is discriminating in the terms, conditions, privileges, services, or facilities for the sale or rental of housing. Housing discrimination is perpetuated by other elements such as segregation, predatory lending, and gentrification. The Fair Housing Act, which is Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, uh, amended later, prohibits discrimination in seven protected classes. Race, color, national origin, including ancestry, religion, sex, including sexual harassment, disability, both physical and mental, and familial status, which is defined as the presence of children. It also includes a family where the wife is pregnant. In addition to those federal protected classes, the Illinois Department of Human Rights has additional protected classes. Those are age, which is defined as 40 and over, ancestry, marital status, unfavorable military discharge, military, dis military status, willful interference and or coercion, sexual orientation, gender identity, and order of protection status. Sexual orientation is defined as the actual or perceived heterosexuality, homosexuality, bisexuality, or gender-related identity, whether or not traditionally associated with the person's designated sex at birth. Order of protection status is a person's status as being a person protected under an order of protection issued pursuant 
to the Illinois Domestic Violence Act of 1986 or an order of protection issued by a court of another state. The Federal Fair Housing Law also requires that entities receiving federal funds, such as cities and municipalities and HUD grantees, to affirmatively further fair housing and promote integration. As an example of the enforcement of affirmatively furthering fair housing, a few years ago, HUD and the federal government reached a settlement with Westchester County in New York with a $12.6 million withholding of their grant funds. They are required to um, explain how it will overcome how they will overcome municipal zoning codes that could discriminate against black and Hispanic residents. This settlement was reached after the federal government decided that Westchester County had not been affirmatively further in fair housing even though they had affirmed that they had been as they received their grants each year. One of the aspects of being able to file a fair housing complaint is that it concerns a dwelling. A dwelling is defined as a temporary or a permanent resident to which a person intends to return. That's been interpreted fairly expansively by the courts. For instance, almost every type of residential property is covered, including houses and apartments, co-ops, condominiums, worker housing, migrant worker housing, summer homes and timeshares, nursing homes, and homeless shelters that are more than overnight shelters. There are some exemptions for certain properties in the federal law. Individuals who own three single family homes or less at any one time are exempt. Senior housing, which we will talk about later, for 62 or older or 55 or older, religious organizations and private clubs, the rental of an apartment in a building with four units or less if the owner lives in one of the units. This is called the Miss Murphy exemption. Remember, housing providers are allowed to select tenants using criteria that are based on valid business reasons. That would include acceptable credit history, a minimum income, or positive references from previous landlords, as long as these criteria are applied equally to all participants. A variety of activities regarding rental and purchase of a home are prohibited under the Fair Housing Law. For instance, refusing to sell or rent, negotiate for the sale or rental of a property, or otherwise making unavailable or denying a dwelling because of a person's protected status. The protected status relates to the categories that we talked about uh, that do protect people on those bases. In addition, imposing different terms, conditions, privileges, or services because of a person's protected status. I've got a uh, shoot. Lying about the availability of a dwelling because of a person's protected status. Engaging in steering or blockbusting. Retaliating against, interfering with, or intimidating a person who has exercised his or her fair housing rights. Fair housing laws cover people with disabilities. Under federal law, the definition is an impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, such as breathing, walking, or working. This is the same definition that is in the ADAA of 2008. In addition, having a record of such an impairment or being regarded as having such impairment 
but not current addiction to an illegal controlled substance. State law defines a disability as a determinable physical or mental characteristic resulting from disease, injury, congenital condition of birth or functional disorder that is unrelated to the birth person's ability to acquire, rent, or maintain a housing accommodation. People with disabilities have special protections under both the federal and the state fair housing law. They have the opportunity and the right to request a reasonable accommodation and or a reasonable modification. Reasonable accommodations are changes in rules, policies, practices, or services when necessary to afford a person with a disability equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling. Examples include change in parking rules so that they might have a spot close to their unit, a reserved accessible parking space, a different way to get mail or pay rent, change in the due date for rent. For units that have a no pet policy, persons with a disability are allowed to request an accommodation that would allow them to have a guide, hearing, or support animal. Property owners or condominiums cannot refuse to rent or discriminate in terms, conditions, or privileges if a person with a disability needs a support animal. A pet deposit cannot be char charged because these animals are not considered pets, they're support animals. Actual damages can be recovered if it is due to an animal that has been allowed as a support animal. In addition, there is some confusion about whether or not such animals need to be specifically trained and certified. That is not the case, although some are, many are not, and they do fill the fu function of being a support animal. Reasonable modifications are changes in the physical makeup of a building. For instance, adding support bars to uh, a shower in the bathroom, removing doors that would allow a wheelchair to have access, changing the sink to a lower level to accommodate a person in a wheelchair, or adding an exterior ramp so persons in a wheelchair might have access. In addition, a reasonable modification in most cases can be at the expense of the person with a dis disability making the request. That would not be the case in a publicly supported building or for if the request is something that should have been part of the construction of the building in the first place. Permission to make a modification may be contingent on restoring the premises to pre-modification condition, except for normal wear and tear. The landlord may ask the tenant to pay into an escrow account to account for restoring the premises. However, in most cases, the modification is something that is uh, an advantage to have in a unit because there may be other persons with a handicap that would prefer that unit. Discrimination can come in different forms. It can be overt, which is an obvious, unfair treatment of someone because of their membership in a protected class. It can be differential treatment. This is harder to detect. It is subtle, unfair treatment of one person compared to another based on membership in a protected class. In addition, some practices and policies, even though applied uniformly, can have a disparate impact. That means that they result in a discriminatory effect on a group of protected persons, and the policy is not justified by business necessity. Evidence of discrimination can take many forms. There might be signs or ads of a discriminatory nature. Statements might be made. 
about who or who not will not be run into disparate treatment that could take the form of differential rent, different security deposits, uh, just being treated differently because of the status of a person. Testing evidence can be evidence of discrimination, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, there may be documents that would be part of proving that discrimination was uh, affected against someone and, in addition, testimony of witnesses. Fair housing testing is a very important component of enforcing the fair housing laws. Fair housing testing is a simulated housing transaction used by fair housing organizations and the government. It is designed to obtain evidence of any differential treatment based on an individual's protected class status. An organization that is doing fair housing testing typically will set up volunteers with similar, similar profiles and housing needs, but with different protected class statuses, such as race or disability, for the same available housing unit to see if they are treated differently because of their protected class status. They will generally, for instance, report to have the same type of income, uh, if it's, they will have the same number of people in the family that want to rent the unit, and that will allow to see if they're being treated differently because of their inclusion in a protected class. Testing can occur in the rental, real estate, sales, lending markets, and testing has actually been approved all the way up to the Supreme Court as an important component of enforcing our fair housing laws. Without testing, most housing discrimination goes undetected. Fair Housing Accessibility Guidelines call for all covered multifamily dwellings to have accessible design features. These include public and common areas accessible to persons with disabilities, doors and hallways wide enough for wheelchairs, an accessible route into and through the unit, accessible light switches, electrical outlets, thermostats, and other environmental controls, reinforced bathroom walls to allow later installation of grab bars, and kitchens and bathrooms that can be used by people in wheelchairs. Covered multifamily buildings are those built for first occupancy after March 13, 1999. They must be designed and constructed to include certain features of accessible housing. They are defined as buildings consisting of four or more units. If they have one or more elevators, and ground floor units in other buildings consisting of four or more units. The Act's design and construction requirements apply to privately owned housing, federally or publicly assisted housing, and to all types of housing when the housing is located in buildings containing four or more dwelling units. This would include single family homes that are in a building of four units, apartments, condominiums, dormitories, assisted living developments, time-sharing properties, and homeless shelters when used as a residence. The requirements do not apply to multi-story townhomes that do not have elevators or to single-family detached homes. As part of its obligation to provide technical assistance to states, units of local government, and others, HUD has established Fair Housing Accessibility Guidelines. The guidelines are intended to provide a safe harbor for compliance with the accessibility requirements of the Fair Housing Act. Although these guidelines are not the only method of complying with the Act, they are most commonly known and utilized by the industry. All these provisions actually went into effect in 1991. Discrimination in advertising is often a factor in bringing a fair housing complaint. 
It's illegal to make, print, or publish ad indicating a preference, limitation, or discrimination based on a protected class factor. This law applies to persons or entities placing ads. That could be landlords, home sellers, realtors, or lenders, advertising preparing such ads, or publishers presenting such ads, including newspapers and some other media, directories, and multiple listing service but not internet listings such as Craigslist. In those cases, just the person placing the ad could be found liable, but not the internet provider. In printed advertising, it's important that it include, if there are human models in the advertising, that diverse models be used, diverse as to race, family type, etc. And be cautious of using descriptive statements that may not seem to be discriminatory but would discourage a certain class of people. For instance, advertising that a unit is perfect for empty nesters uh, would be inappropriate because it would discourage families from applying. In order to file a fair housing complaint, there are three factors that need to be considered. One, does it involve a dwelling? Two, is the person filing the complaint a member of a protected class? And three, are, is there a discriminatory action toward that person that would prevent or change the terms of rental or selling of a home. Persons in Illinois outside of Cook County have two options for filing a discriminatory housing complaint. First would be the Federal Fair Housing Act. The information uh, would go to HUD within one year after the discriminatory action or when this discriminatory action ceases, in other words, the last act of discrimination, or if going into federal court, there are two years in which to file. Under the Human Rights Act of Illinois, the allegation must be filed within one year. Filing under either one of these venues can provide certain kind of relief if the charge is found to be true. Under the Federal Fire Fair Housing Act, make hold damages such as movie expenses, rent differentials, and emotional distress damages can be awarded, as well as punitive damages, fines, injunctive relief such as an order to sell or rent to the person filing the complaint. In addition, the prevailing complainant can be awarded their attorney's fees and costs. Under the Illinois Human Rights Act, similar damages can be awarded. Additional information on fair housing can be sought from agencies funded by HUD and also from the Illinois Department of Human Rights and from HUD itself. The information for HUD uh, is listed in the webinar. They are located in Chicago. It's a regional office. They have a toll-free number, 800-669-977, and they have a TDD number, 800-927-9275. Their web page is at webmanager at hud.gov. For the Illinois Department of Human Rights, they're located in Chicago. Their Chicago regional office is 312-814-6229. Their toll-free number is 800-662-3942, and their TTY number is 866-744. 
thank you for listening to this webinar. And again, there are additional specific webinars, for instance, on disability, a webinar for condos, for immigrants, that you can also access in the same way that you reach this webinar. Thank you.